sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in the stones, and good in everything. The storm struck out of the southwest on August 3rd. It developed rapidly in a matter of hours, from a steady blow to a howling rage of shifting cloud, rain and wind, and the four cardinal points of the horizon galloped at me like the horsemen of the apocalypse, and me in the middle of them, waiting, vulnerable, patient. Hold on to your hat, old lad. We've got some fun and games coming, I said to Nelson, my three-legged Labrador retriever, as I watched the sky turn first into sombre grey and then menacing blackness with sheets of lightning electrifying the whole heaving grey-green watery curve of the world. Creswell plunged on away from the Arctic Circle, which she had passed over only the day before. By the time the gale freshened to a full storm, I was exhausted. I had set out on July 10th, 1961, from Svalbard for Iceland, 800 miles away to the southwest. With the prevailing wind against me, this distance was doubled. I thought I had recovered my strength and wits during the days in Svalbard and Creswell was again sound. I first headed due south to latitude 71, so as to avoid any ice flows which might have broken loose from the main pack, and I headed due west for Jan Mayen, with the idea that if anything went amiss, I could shelter in those lonely islands. But the wind shifted to the northwest, and I was forced away to the south, so I missed Yan Mayan entirely. By July 25th, I was 180 miles due north of the northeast tip of Iceland. With the northwest wind, I had a close reach and the boat was making fast time. I aimed to reach Cape Farewell, the southern tip of Greenland, not later than August 30th. From there, with the Greenland current helping me westward until it joined the southerly running Labrador current, it was around 800 miles to St. John's, Newfoundland. If my luck held out, I should reach there by the end of September. I would have to push it because my margin of safety, food-wise, was narrow indeed, only three weeks. On July 31st, I was in the Denmark Strait, heading southwest on a broad reach over the heaving waters, sometimes sighting Icelandic and British fishing vessels over the white, silver-topped, flashing green seas. Now came August, and with it the end of the short Arctic summer. In the Arctic, for almost two years, my diet had consisted mainly of rice, seal blubber, fish, and corned beef, and I was down to a wiry 120 pounds. Besides, I was suffering from what I call Arctic situs, a kind of latitude which slows you down. Everything is in slow motion, though you are unaware of it until you encounter someone who hasn't got it. It's something like a man from the mountains plodding along at his pace for years, nice and easy and perfectly normal to him. 
Then he goes to New York and immediately there's a difference in time, almost a time warp. After two years alone in the Arctic, even the mountain man would seem like a big city tycoon. Anyway, it blew seven bells and the sea worked up into monsters. I had been hove to under reef mizzen only when suddenly this great mountain of water out of nowhere crashed down onto Cresswell. I had not much fear of the hull giving way for she was double diagonal mahogany on grown Portuguese oak frames with oiled canvas between the mahogany planks which were beautifully laid with copper fastenings. The deck house I had added myself, continuing the original hull specifications all around. The masts were stepped on deck in galvanized iron tabernacles. This was mainly for ease in dropping the mast when they were in danger of icing up too thick. The sea that came on board was heavy and strong enough to bend the tabernacle, which was made of half-inch thick galvanized iron. This put such a strain on the starboard chain plates that they ripped right out of the hull. Amazing, for they were fixed through the side with three-quarter inch diameter phosphor bronze bolts, six to each chain plate. Of course, as soon as the shrouds on the starboard side twanged away, over went the mast to port. At the same time, the whole boat was lifted up and flung, I don't know how far, then slammed onto the leeward seas with such a shock that it broke the engine loose from its bed. The engine started to dance around and it was all I could do to lasso the thing and secure it with a Spanish windlass. If it tore the shaft out of the stern tube, I would have had a long, cold row in the dinghy to Iceland, about 300 miles to the southeast. But my luck was in, and after a hard struggle, I got the engine secured. When I went aloft, the sight that met my eyes was enough to make a bloody bishop burn his Bible. The main mast was splintered like a banana peel, as far as the hound's bands. It was dangling over the side and there was a forest of tangled shroud wires and wrecked, torn sails all over the top sides. In the roaring grey twilight, with the hounds of death screaming in my ears, all the way from Cape Farewell, I slowly and patiently cleared away the mess. The shrouds I chopped off with an axe, which I kept razor sharp for this very purpose. Then I set to work on the mainmast. Finally, I managed to heave the whole rig over the side, for it had been threatening with violent motions to stove in the side. It was a relief to get rid of it. At least Creswell would now be one entity and not a dozen all working against each other. I crawled back down below to size up the situation. I was still under reefed mizzen, which was holding her head up against the seas. Even if she broached too, I wasn't too concerned, for she was built like a barrel and, mastless, would probably just roll right over. I decided to wait until the storm subsided, then rig a forestay from the top of the mizzen to the bow and try to make for Reykjavik or Hunafloy in Iceland. Then, once I was safely at anchor, I could clear up the mess and plan repairs. It proved impossible under that rig to make Iceland, and I was forced to head for Norway, 1,000 miles away on the other side of the Arctic Ocean. It took me from August 3rd until October 18th, 76 days, during which I endured gale force winds and stronger for 49 days.
My galley stove was useless since the pipe which fed the kerosene to the burners had snapped and there was no spare. It contained a needle mechanism to regulate the kerosene supply and I could not manage a jury rig so I ate cold food all the way, dried fish and porridge mixed with a bit of water. I still had a good supply of nuts which kept me going for a couple of weeks. Nelson went on short rations, that is, half a day's food every other day. By the time I reached the Norwegian fishing fleet and had some potatoes ready cooked and bread passed to me, I was even considering eating Nelson. I encountered Norwegian herring boats about 200 miles west of Narvik. When they saw my predicament, they dropped supplies in a barrel over the side, for the seas were too rough to chance coming alongside me. Then the Norwegian Air Force sent a plane out twice a day to check that I was all right and guide me into the West Fjord and Lofoten Island. By the time I got in, I was ready for a good meal and a couple of beers. So there I was, as the old saying goes, fed up and far from home, with my boat in a shambles, the old fire pump engine off its bed, no mainmast, two tins of corned beef in the galley locker, and five pounds of Lipton tea carefully wrapped in spare oilskin. Loferton in September isn't exactly like the south of France or Miami Beach. What with a cold fit to freeze the balls off a brass monkey and the stink of fish permeating everything. But at least the vessel was safe and that was the main thing. Creswell was tied up alongside a fishing wharf, subsidiary and remote to the main one, which was agog day and night with noise and activity. Being Welsh, and to the Norwegians, obviously stark raving mad, I had been relegated to an unfrequented corner of the harbour, rife with derelict fishing boats and not much else. Topsides, the sleet pattered down with gentle threats of another hard winter ahead. Below, although I had done what I could to make things shipshape, Creswell looked like a port said bum boat, ragged, tattered sails, ragged, tattered blankets, smelling to high heaven, and a ragged, tattered skipper, thanking his lucky stars he still had some tea left. My lame old dog sadly resigned himself forward, while all around us the snow-topped hills resigned themselves to winter. I set to making tea, boiled spuds and gravy. I'd save my corned beef for an emergency. Luckily, I still had kerosene for the lamp and stove, so the cabin soon warmed up. I was just dishing out the grub when there was a knock on the doghouse roof. I replaced the lid on the pan, sealing off the delicious aroma of British boiled potatoes and called, Right-o, old chum, I'll be right up. Thank you.